United, United Nations neither. In fact, there's like another four paragraphs about her, but you can, we can't fit them all into this little introduction. So that's just a bit about her level of expertise. And today, she's going to speak to her book, which is titled She Took Justice, The Black Woman, Law and Power from 1619 to 1969. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Professor Gloria J. Brown Marshall. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Tony. And um, I'm looking forward to the end of this pandemic so that I can be a part of Black History Walks. The website is extraordinary. I think it's all just a fantastic way for us to connect with our African brothers and sisters, um, a part of the diaspora, to learn more about each other and to continue the walk that we walk. Um, I think it's also very important for us to, to know where African-Americans have been. And so um, any of the, uh, the um, different programs that Tony has, that he, he leads or he has people coming in discussing the issues of, of the Africana experience in Europe, in particular the UK and um, London, I think that it's well worth it. So we're all looking forward to being able to get over there and learn more about ourselves. And you can learn a lot about, about ourselves and where we've been in London through his website. I wanna apologize for those people for getting the time wrong. I saw that I had written 3.30 as the time in Eastern time and I was wrong um, in my math between GMT and EST, Eastern Standard Time, and I apologize. And so I'm therefore uh, recording this talk to make up for the, the um, mistake on my part for those people who want to um, hear this. And I know there are a lot of people who did and they're waiting to get the link at, at 3.30. So going forward, I wrote this book, She Took Justice, The Black Woman, Law and Power, um, because I was writing my book, Race, Law, and American Society, as a civil rights attorney in very small towns in Alabama and Georgia. And as I was sitting in these motel rooms, there was nothing else to do late at night, having met with these Black families trying to get equality and justice for their children, for themselves, for their community. And I realized that um, it was just not my lifetime or the lifetime before me where people had spent their lives and livelihoods seeking justice. It was um, generations and there were generations before that. And so I ended up being in the 1600s doing research on the law, but then it took me to a point of 1619 and we'll talk a little bit more about that when I realized where we came from somewhere. So where were we before that? My area is law, it's legal history, it's social legal, um, equality, um, vulnerable groups and protections under law, international law. My area is law writ large. And so when I think about law, I don't think about just the courtroom. I think about the way that law has power, how laws are created, the people who have a personal and professional stake in, in enacting laws, and the people who actually have a voice in their communities through lawmakers and legal representatives. So at this point, when I'm looking at law from that bigger picture and I'm thinking about Africa, I go back to the kings and queens of Africa because they were the lawmakers. They were the people who were responsible for instituting the laws that were made by their elders, by other people within the community. There were structures, governmental structures in Africa. I teach um, about federal governmental structures here in the United States. And so there's always this assumption that before the Europeans arrived in Africa, there were no governmental structures and there were. There were governmental structures. There was a way in which the voices could be heard. There were representatives who spoke to the kings and queens of the time. And there were also those who based on their religious beliefs, based on their skills, based on any number of things were in certain hierarchies within that power structure, how many animals they, earned, they owned, how much land they had, all of the same um, indicia of what brings us wealth today, our possessions were in place then as well. So we had a government, we had an economic society, we had a political process, we had um, laws, we had values that were um, in certain ways enforced with punishment that could be death, it could be 
um, marginalization from community or as, as we have prisons are now, all these things were in place. And so when I think about women and I'm researching these cases, I wrote my book, Race Law in American Society, and I saw all these women who were still a part of our society had done so much, had fought against law, had been oppressed by the law, had written law, had become lawyers. Where are they in our conversation? So during Black History Month, that's um, celebrated in the United States in February. And February is um, the, the month that was chosen by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who's the father of Black History Month. And Dr. Carter G. Woodson is the second Black person to graduate with a PhD from Harvard. He's also the person who created Negro History Month, which became Black History, uh, Negro History Week that became Black History Month. And what we then have from that is the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, the organization he created as well. And that organization is, is still alive and strong. And I'm on the board of that organization as well. So all of this comes around to the theme that we have for this year. And ASALA, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, sets the theme each year for Black history. And this year, the theme is the Black family. And that's how I met Tony. And that's how he became a part of the ASALA family. He was already celebrating and commemorating the achievements of, of the African diaspora. And so when we start thinking about that Black history is being celebrated around the world, and we need to connect with people like Tony and with others who are, who are really thinking about the depth and breadth of our history and how our history can inform not just the present, but the future. And so how it informs the, the past to me is in this way, Queen Nzinga. Queen Nzinga, when she was a little girl, used to watch her father, the king, um, and the king was, was called the Angola, N-G-O-L-A. And I wanna point out that the country is now called Angola, the name was changed by the Portuguese because when the Portuguese arrived, they decided that the, the resources, the value of Angola was well worth their deciding to overrun it, to take it over. And that's what the Portuguese did in the name of the Pope who had given free license to those in the old world, that old world being the United Kingdom, France, Spain, the Netherlands, Portugal, to come in and take over the new world as they expanded into North and South America. And so this bridge between us is long and it's short in many ways, because the bridge then takes into account that Brazil, which is a stronghold of Portugal, is right across the Atlantic. If you just look, you will straight across the Atlantic, you will go to Angola, what is now Angola, which was in Dongo during this period. The Portuguese arrived in the 1500s, and at first they met with the heads of state of Ndongo, and there was in the beginning a pleasantry, and then the Portuguese decided, based on the edicts and the papal bull from the Pope at the time, that they were dealing with um, people who were heathenous and without a God, and therefore they were supposed to serve the Christians. This is what's thought of back then. I had a chance to visit um, Angola in 2019 as part of the 400th commemoration of the arrival of 20 Africans into the Virginia colony. And so here we have little Nzinga watching her father negotiate, not just with the tribal leaders who are representing a landmass at that time that was probably the size of New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York, but also negotiating with the Portuguese. And so when the father dies and, and, and Nzinga's brother, who's somewhat of a playboy, decides to take over and he's now the king, the um, Angola, she realizes that her nation is in trouble because she sees that little by little, not only have the Portuguese taken over their land, but they've also now fomented civil unrest in this area. So you have the tribal forces fighting each other. And as they fight each other and they have uh, victims of war, those victims are being bought and sold to the Portuguese. And little by little, Nzinga is seeing what the Portuguese are doing. They're destroying her homeland and she wants them to stop. And she's trying to figure out a way to do it. She's learned diplomatic skills from watching her father, but she's also learned warrior skills by watching her brother. When her brother was 
was practicing with the knife and the spear and Zynga was also shadowing him and she was so good that she bested her brother and was given personal lessons on how to use the spear and so she was actually a better warrior than her brother she became a better strategist as well so when her brother fearful of the Portuguese asking for a meeting to write a, a peace treaty between the two her brother sends in Zynga in 1622 her brother sends Nzinga to negotiate a peace treaty with the Portuguese, Governor Carrera. And so she goes to Luanda, which is the capital of Angola, and she is to meet with a Governor de Sousa, a Governor Carrera, who's been sent by de Sousa. Now, here's what's so interesting about this. She is meeting there on her own homeland, but he is now governor of they've made themselves governor of what is we would consider Angola today. So this peace treaty is to stop the fractionist wars that are taking place and these battles that are uh, hurting her country. When she arrives as decked out in her elegance as queen with golden bracelets and ivory, can you imagine? And the smells of the oil she's been given by her handmaids. When she arrives, there is a mat on the floor. She has no seat. These um, uh, po these uh, Portuguese and these these men of stature, these powerful men, are seated in these large high back chairs, and she has a mat on the floor. So she is to negotiate a treaty, and they think this treaty negotiation is going to last about two days. She is negotiate to negotiate this treaty, seated on the floor or standing up, and she is a queen. So. Queen Nzinga looks around, realizes what the situation is as these white men sit on their high wooden chairs, looking down with smirks on their faces, waiting for her to sit on the floor to negotiate from a power, a, a position of weakness, and the power would be, all be in their hands. And upon clapping her hands, her maidservants know exactly what to do. They come forward and kneel down on their hands and knees and Queen Nzinga gracefully and elegantly sits on their backs and she uses their backs as a seat. She uses their backs so that she can negotiate this peace treaty. I want to also realize when I'm reading this and I'm writing this and I'm learning more about it and I'm going to Angola and talking to the people there about her and there is a nearly um, 60 foot statue of Queen Nzinga that's in front of the war museum with a spear in her hand standing forward and in my book there is a picture of me in front of Queen Nzinga because I just wanted to be a part of that legacy, in even the smallest way I could, that when the peace treaty fails, Queen Nzinga takes on her strategic warrior skills and through guerrilla warfare, terrorizes the Portuguese. Her name is feared among them. When she comes in, they've gone up into the mountains to hide in the retreat. There are certain men after her uh, brother dies, we know that he was poisoned. He did not die of natural causes. And their fear is that Queen Nzinga, realizing her brother's weakness with the Portuguese, decides he needs to be out of the way. Yes, we have queens and kings of Africa who rival in the intricacies of their rule the, the kings and queens of England, I would say in my estimation, and they need to be studied more. So many of these kings and queens are people with whom we should be very familiar so that our history does not begin with enslavement. Our history begins where it rightfully should, and that is with the vast, deep, rich legacy that we have been given. We have Nefertiti, Amina, Queen of Zaria. We have Candace, the Empress of Ethiopia. Makeda, the Queen of Sheba. And Hetzepet, Queen of Kemet. And we have the Queen of Kahina, Dahia al Kahina. There are so many different queens in Ya Asantawa, of course. And we still have kings and queens of Africa as we speak today. So here we have. Queen Nzinga attacking the Portuguese, but as you know, in history speaks, she did not defeat their efforts. 
to enslave and populate their new world with the labor they so needed to expand it. But at the same time, all of this is happening in Angola, we have the opening of the new world by the English. And that is in 1607, the Jamestown settlement. The Jamestown, Jamestown settlement in Virginia is a settlement named, of course, after King James. And I had the opportunity to be in the King James Palace when I was in London last um, in 2018. So that was really a very um, strange thing to stand in the palace of King James after speaking his name so often in my, my studies and my books and my uh, classes that I teach. And so King James, um, the Jamestown settlement is in Virginia in 1607. We have so many things that happen in that colony in the very beginning. For one, um, there is this horrible drought that takes place. And during this drought, there's cannibalism. Yes, cannibalism takes place in the Jamestown settlement because the Powhatan Native Americans upon whose land they have settled want them to leave. And so they build this fort in Jamestown, which is on the river named the James River in the colony of Virginia and the Native Americans who were first patient with them, they decide they want them gone. They begin to attack the fort. And so these people, these English settlers can't get out of the fort. So now they can't find food. It's the worst drought um, in Virginia's history. And now we have people who began to use cannibalism as a way to survive. And the reason why we know this is because there are remains of someone in the museum in James town who uh, was a victim of cannibalism and so it's not my my thought my saying so it is of record and that's what we like very much i think and appreciate about law is that people have written this down so you can find anything i say you can find out for yourself either online or looking up the actual um areas where these things take took place in jamestown a museum is available for you to see the remains of the little girl who was the victim of cannibalism. So we're thinking about what this settlement must have been like in the 1600s when these 20 and odd Africans who among others, hundreds of others who have been um, hostages taken from their homeland in Angola, forced upon a ship that ship then is attacked in the high seas. It's attacked by an English privateer. This English privateer ship attacks the, um, the Portuguese or on the Spanish flagship, and it knows that it has human cargo within that ship. It attacks the ship, and the White Lion is the English ship that then abort, boards the, um, the um, ship that's coming from Angola takes the people from there and puts them onto this English ship that has now been listing and in bad shape after this battle. If you can imagine being in chains in the hold of a ship in the dark and above you, you hear this cannon fire going back and forth. And then one ship, there were two ships filled with people from Angola who had been kidnapped and held hostage being, to, they were on their way to Mexico. They were being taken there to be the labor force for the Portuguese. And so that ship goes under can you imagine that you're on this ship and it begins to take on water and it sinks to the bottom of the Atlantic? The other ship is the ship that's taken over by the White Lion, the English privateer ship. It's looking for a place to dock for repairs. It knows that the closest colony is actually a Spanish colony. And that is what is now Florida, which was a Spanish colony. But there are tensions between England and Spain. And so it bypasses as best it can that Spanish colony. And it arrives on the only English colony that is in North America. And that is the Virginia colony. And that's how those 20 and odd Africans arrive in the Virginia colony in August of 1619 where there are black men, women, and children, African men, women, and children, who then are a part of the legacy, who become the Adam and Eve of so many of us around the African diaspora. They're from Angola. So going forward with these women, men, women, and children, Angela is the first known African woman in the Virginia colony. 
first she's referred to as Angelo, and then she's referred to as Angela. And so she is that first person in the Virginia colony. She's a servant, but we don't know exactly what happened to her. We know that she is um, in the census in one year in 1619. Again, by 1621, we're not sure where she is. So we don't know because the Native Americans have been attacking if she died or if she ran away or where she was because she disappears from the census. But we do know there are other women there. There's there's Isabella and there's Mary and Mary marries um, Anthony Johnson and Mary and Anthony Johnson become a couple who own land and have European and African servants of their own in the 1600s, Mary and Anthony Johnson. They own land, they have servants, they would have been the viable force that would create, of course, the economy, social, political power of the African American. But of course, the month before the Africans arrive in 1619, the House of Burgesses is created. That is the lawmaking body. And those lawyers, those lawmakers, then create laws that little by little take away the rights of the Africans. So we have these Africans, we have the Europeans, the English, the, the Spanish, no, the English, the um, Irish, and the Scottish. We also have the Native Americans. So we have all of this diversity in this one small area. So it's never been about diversity in America. It's been about power and it's always been about power. And the power is, is then um, used and misused by those who want to maintain their point of privilege. Law and violence has created the oppression that people of color have dealt with from that time period of 1619 and even before. And so as we go forward, I want to talk about the fact that there are a number of English American um, um, circumstances, historical events that take place. One of them is Elizabeth Key. Elizabeth Key is the daughter of, of Thomas Key. Thomas Key is an Englishman. Now the laws are going to be firmer and firmer against having any relationships between a person of color and a person who's English, male or female. And so we have this issue in which we have um, Thomas Key who has a relationship with Black Bess, who is Angolan. And they have the child, Elizabeth Key. Elizabeth Key is considered a mulatto under law. And you see this, we talk talking about biracial today, but back then there's always been biracial people. And so they were, they were called mulattoes during this time period. And so the status of a mulatto child is now in question. Thomas Key goes back to England, leaving Elizabeth Key there under the instruction that she is to be taken care of as a full citizen of the colony. However, the greed gets the best of the people who are there and the man she left, she's left with decides he's going to use her as an enslaved person, a laborer for life. And so at this point, Elizabeth Key brings the first lawsuit we know of a woman of color bringing in the North American region. She brings a lawsuit for her freedom. She sues, she gets a lawyer. Yes, it's an American way, we sue everybody. We've been suing for a long time. And so we start our lawsuits as early as we possibly can in the 1650s. Elizabeth Key brings a lawsuit suing for her freedom. And she uses the transcript where there is this issue where Thomas Key has been um, criticized and has to pay a fine for laying down with an African woman. So they've made it against the law for a European and an African to come together, even in a love relationship. And at this point, Thomas Key loved Black Bess and he also loved his daughter. This was not, as we understand it, a rape relationship that we see it as an assault as many other of these relationships will become. And so this lawsuit is lost in the beginning, but the House of Burgesses decides to grant um, Elizabeth Key the power to have uh, her freedom. But as soon as they do, they create a law that says the status of any child born of an African woman becomes that of the woman. So if this child is born of an enslaved woman, then that child is considered enslaved. It birth is a slave. And that's how we create it slavery in this country by law, because there were no slave laws in 1619 when these Africans arrived. 
I want us to also go very quickly into some of the other laws that you can see the vestiges of those laws or the remnants that we're dealing with today. The next one is by 1669. It is not a felony by law if a European kills an African in that colony. 1669, the laws passed that if in correcting um, an African, that African's life is lost, that European will not be charged with a felony. So this is what we're dealing with to this day. And then by 1680, Virginia passes a law that says that Africans have no right of self-defense. We are not to lift our hands against any Christian. And that's what a white person was called. A European was called a Christian. So there was no way in which we were supposed to protect our children, protect our parents, our parents to protect their children, a husband to protect his wife. That right of self-defense was taken away in 1680. We're still dealing with that issue where it's so appalling if a black person supports or protects or tries in any way to um, defend their family, they are considered wrong and then gunned down and there is no felony or convicted charge against a person who's doing this horrible thing against a person of color. We're still li living with that today. I want us to go forward very quickly um, to, to three other cases and three other cases that I want to, to discuss with you. Um, one of them is the Salem witch trials. And the Salem witch trials, and the reason why I use law, as I said before, because law was a way in which we can actually read the words of what happened back then. There's not a lot of speculation when it comes to what the law was because they wrote it down. And because these are cases with transcripts that one can actually read the transcript and know what took place. But sometimes when it comes to people, women, people of color and others who are marginalized, you have to read between the lines to know exactly what was happening. So that we know in 1669, the Africans were rising up. They weren't just sitting back allowing this to happen. And because they were rising up and the Europeans were killing them because they were not allowed to have weapons themselves, then they said, oh, we're we're going to put down the, the uprisings of Africans and we're not going to charge the, the Europeans with any type of crime or having killed the Africans for rising up. So when we get to Massachusetts, which I think is very interesting because most people believe that the um, arrival of the pilgrims begins American history. And as I've indicated, that's not true. American history finds its anchor in 1607 with the founding of the Jamestown settlement in the Virginia colony. However, if you want to talk about um, the pilgrims, then consider this. The Africans arrived in 1619. The pilgrims, the Mayflower, arrived in 1620. We were here before the Mayflower. Africans were here in, in Virginia before the Mayflower. And when we talk about American history, Africans were here in North America uh, a century before that. So um, the Salem witch trials, we had black witches during the Salem witch trials. Yes, we, we know about Tatuba, who was from Barbados. And we are told in the Salem witch trials, 1692, horrible winter. And the tuba from Barbados, who is the servant for life, is playing with these children in the woods. These little white children who are bored, these little girls. And she comes up with a game that she used to play when she was in Barbados. This is what we are speculating based on the testimony. And in the woods during this winter with these bored girls, she then puts these like, little branches together and she starts talking about you know, the power of these little twigs she's putting together and what they represented in Barbados. Well, the little girls then take this notion that they've been bewitched. Now, there's already this, this uh, fire and brimstone preacher who's been preaching about witches and the devil and possession. And so when they look at these little twigs that um, Tatuba has put together, and the girls, one of whom gets sick, they don't know why she's sick, they then jump to the conclusion that she's possessed by the devil. The other little white girls decided that if you're possessed by the devil, then you don't have to do your chores. Life is more interesting. And so it's been thought that because they were receiving attention they never would have received otherwise, they decided to really play out this whole sense of being 
um, attacked by the devil, possessed by the devil, and that these women, the women they didn't like, the women who punished them would be the ones who were carriers of this evil spirit and the ones who were possessing them. And so we have from the trial transcript, actual testimony from the Salem witch trials of the three women of color. They are Tatuba, Mary Black, and Candy. And they are servant women in Salem who have been also accused of witchcraft. By this time, we need to know there are already people who have been put to death, accused of being witches and executed. And they are Rebecca Nurse, as well as Susanna Martin, Elizabeth Howe, Sarah Good, Sarah Wiles. They've been hanged July 19th, 1692 all convicted of witchcraft because the thought is thou shalt not allow a witch to live. So here we have the testimony of Mary Black and Candy who are also accused of witchcraft. And I'll just very quickly say, in this testimony, the magistrate asks Mary Black, question, Mary, you are accused of sundry acts of witchcraft. Tell me, be you a witch? Now, Mary is silent. She's already seen the white women accused of witchcraft are dead. They have been executed when they denied being witches. So she answers, I cannot tell when they ask her, how long has she been a witch? But you have been a witch. I cannot tell you. Why do you hurt these folks? I hurt no one. And so in the end, all three women confess to being witches. This is their way to navigate the harm that is there waiting for all people of color and especially black women. They have to navigate a society that is one in which they are oppressed by their gender as well as their race. It was thought of that the devil was black. And so the devil would make these um, girls, these women sign their souls away in a book. And we know that later on that there was no devil. Well, We'll talk about that later. With that, at this point, that the devil was actually someone that was made up by Ann Putnam Jr., who sat back and watched people being put to death. And so since 1706, that Ann comes forward and confesses that she made it all up. And she said the devil made her do it. Okay, that was her excuse. That was her rationale. But let's go forward. And I want to go um, very quickly into the 1700s because now we have um, actual chattel slavery where we have the importation and the exportation of human beings. It ended in um, the exportation and importation in England, as you know, um, in, in 1807, but it ended under the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, in 1808. And that was supposed to be the end of the importation and exportation of human beings. Of course, we know slavery itself did not end in 1808. It continued. But what also continued was that not only do we have to have enslavement in this country for those slaveholders under law, but now we have to have a mechanism to continue to create product. And that's where the Black woman is now used as a machine to produce the labor force of America. The African-American woman's body now is used in a way in which is brutalized to use to the kindest word, assaulted in order to have more and more children to now supplement the labor force lost from the end of the importation of Africans from Africa. And there are conventions held if you can imagine that these people, slaveholders, are meeting to figure out ways to get as many babies out of a black woman's body without killing her. This is what's happening in the United States of America between 1808 until 1865 when enslavement ends. During that period, black women didn't just sit back and take it. And that's why I want to give you the case of Celia. And Celia is a, just a young girl when she is bought by Mr. Folsom. And she's bought in a way in which um, it's already understood she is to be his concubine. Not just a maid, not just someone working for free, but someone who is supposed to uh, pleasure him on a moment's notice. 
And this is why she's purchased. And this is in Missouri, in Fulton, Missouri. And when she is taken home uh, on the way, he rapes her just to make sure she understands what part of her job will entail for the rest of her life. That, that this part, that being assaulted by him will be part of the job she has. Her responsibilities will extend from morning to night with all the labor. And then at night, he would come creeping into her little cabin that he built especially for her so that he could have privacy when he would go and rape her. This is taking place year after year until finally Celia has had enough. And Celia is now um, talking, having had a child by, um, by this man, she is now talking to one of the other enslaved men. She has an infatuation with this man. She's in love. This is her first love. The man says to her, who's also enslaved, well, I don't know what you're doing with this Newsom, who's a slaveholder, but if Mr. Newsom is still the person who's coming into your cabin, then I don't want anything else to do with you. So now Celia has a choice. She's a teenager. She's, she's been told that it's either Newsom or this man she loves, who's also enslaved. So Newsom sees the two of them together and comes to her and says, you know, um, I don't like you talking to this man. I want to end this and I'm coming to your cabin tonight. So Newsom comes to the cabin and Celia says something that no woman of color is supposed to say to her a white slaveholder, and that is no. Celia says no to Robert Newsom. Robert Newsom approaches her in the cabin. Celia picks up a log from the fire and hits him again and again and again until he's dead and after he's dead she knows that she's in trouble she cuts up his body and she burns the pieces and then she buries the pieces in the backyard behind um, her cabin the next day of course they ask what happened to robert newsom and what they find is that celia says she doesn't know anything the people on the plantation say they know nothing but that young man whom she loves so much says I don't know, you should ask Celia again. They go back and say, Celia, this man says you may know something more than you're saying. And Celia um, confesses. Here is where the law comes in and what women and so many of these women have had to deal with. And this is one, the lack of self-defense, but the other is the fact that if she had been a white woman and there was an assault, she would be able to testify in court about the assault and she would be able to, of course, defend herself and the law would protect her. But an African woman had no rights. An African woman, no African person, no person of color could, could actually testify in a court of law against a white person. So she could not testify on, on her own behalf as to what happened. She is not supposed to protect herself. And at this point, she is um, without any hope the jury is made up of all white men, many of them slaveholders, and they find her guilty. She was pregnant at the time, and they give her enough time to give birth to that child. That child is stillborn, and she is hanged. Celia is hanged for the murder of Robert Newsom. That is one of these wildest type of stories, like an OJ story that's in all the newspapers at the time in the 1850s. Um, I wanna go very quickly into other women, women who um, were fighting for their freedom at the time. So you had freedom lawsuits being brought by women like Sarah Borders, who escaped into a free territory. And she brings an unsuccessful false imprisonment case against her slaveholder. But think about this, you have women bringing legal cases against their slaveholders who are saying, I was taken into a free state and now you have me into a slave state. And so therefore I am supposed to be free. We have um, women who are suffragettes who are fighting for their right to vote. White women suffragettes are not allowing these black women like Sojourner Truth, like Harriet Tubman to be a part of their suffragettes movement. So these black women create their own suffragettes movements. We have um, so many women in which uh, we have, for example, Maria Stewart, 
who was born in 1803, was an educator, writer, and abolitionist, and she addressed the African-American Female Intelligence Society in Boston. Yes, there was an African-American Female Intelligence Society in 1832. So there were women in different stages of their intellectual development, women in different stages of their physical freedom and liberation. But as we go forward, you know about Ida B. Wells Barnett, who visited London many times, who gained her fame by trying to sit in a first class section of a train. Um, and she was taken, dragged forcibly from that train and then sued the train owner. And after that lawsuit, um, first she won and then she appealed and it was lost. But she made um, such a name for herself and writing about the lawsuit and the unfairness of racism that uh, she became this very well-known person. She had been um, educated to be a teacher and she taught for a while. She became a journalist after she wrote these articles. And as she was trying to um, tell the world about what was taking place with lynching in the South, especially in Memphis, she became a target of attack and had to move to Chicago. But she spent a number of years in London trying to gain support internationally. And that's been something that takes place, uh, uh, I would say, from the early 1800s going forward, that we had um, figures from America going to London, um, trying to gain support for the cause, whether or not that was Frederick Douglass, who was in um, England many times, as well as in um, other parts of the UK. But we had people who um, traveled there in order to gain support, anti-slavery um, support, but also anti-lynching support from, from Europe. Um, going forward, the suffragettes included Mary Church Terrell, and I hope you know more about Mary Church Terrell. She's also one who has visited England. She was from Washington, D.C. She lived a very long time, from 1863 to 1954. And during that time period, she was an activist in Washington, bringing lawsuits and helping as a grassroots activist people to gain entree to um, educational facilities, to restaurants, to public facilities like the theater. She worked many times um, by herself, but other times she was part of organizations and like the National Association of Negro Women and other organizations to, to make sure that not just the intellectuals and people who are educated, but also the working people were pushing forward to get their education and to have access to what the country had to offer. Daisy Bates is someone I really want you to find out more about. Daisy Bates was in Little Rock, Arkansas, and she was a person who not only led um, the, um, the Little Rock Nine to uh, integrate the Central High School. There are many movies about her and other um, ways in which you can know more about Daisy Bates. But I think also that Daisy Bates was a champion for equal rights. She was a woman who, with style and sophistication, was able to um, stand up against uh, people with such harassment that they would put her telephone number and address in places for the Klan to harass her constantly. And still, she stood up for what is right. And she made sure that um, people in Little Rock and in other parts of Arkansas and the NAACP, when she was secretary there, were those who would um, know that they were they had the bravery, they had the courage to stand up against um, legalized racism. But Claudia Jones, and Claudia Jones is, um, I know, of course, um, someone um, people in England are very familiar with, but I don't think people in the United States are familiar with Claudia Jones. And Claudia Jones was born in 1915 in Trinidad. And she was taken to New York City by her parents when she was very young. In 1939, Claudia Jones becomes the youngest person to head the Communist Youth Party. And the Communist, the Young Communist League and communism became a part of what Claudia Jones believed was the best avenue for equality and for the rise of African Americans. And she became a communist as a teenager and continued that through her entire life. And she paid a very high price because we see in the 1930s, we have the Great Depression. She's watching African Americans suffer. She's seeing the government do so little to help that suffering. And she decides that the Communist Party is the best tool, the best mechanism, the best avenue in order to assist African Americans in this struggle for equality. And so at first she's a writer on the, in the, um, the communist uh, um, 
Weekly Review, which is the newspaper. She becomes the, the editor of it. She's associate editor. She works her way up. She becomes a known force in the Communist Party, and she becomes a known force in New York in the Communist Party. The United States government begins to pay attention to her. And as it begins to pay attention to what Claudia Jones is doing, it begins to put her under surveillance and then to harass her. She is now arrested. She is arrested. And what she learns when she tries to get her passport prior to being arrested was that when her parents brought her to the United States, they did not complete the paperwork to make her a citizen. So now she finds she's in the country illegally. She's convicted. And she's convicted under what's called the Alien Registration Act. And there's also these other laws that have been put in place for people who are speaking against the government. I don't know where these laws were on January 6th when these people were trying to take over the Capitol, but you know, now they're using these federal laws to convict her and to deport her. Very quickly, um, she's convicted she's put into the women's penitentiary in West Virginia. And in 1953, one year and a day is what her, um, her sentence is and a $200 fine. She has hypertension, tuberculosis, asthma, heart condition. She has all of these very, very harmful um, physical ailments. And at the same time, they have her in this dank cell where her health is deteriorating. Hundreds, almost a thousand letters are written saying that she must be able to come out. She has to be released. And finally, on she regains a humanitarian release and she's released and upon her release, she has a heart attack. All of this time, she has not stopped advocating for African-American rights. But by 1955, she is deported and she's deported to England. And so the story of her life and her fight in America has been covered up like Paul Robeson and so many others, W.D.B. Du Bois, so many others who decided that American capitalism was not in the best interest of African-Americans. And like Marcus Garvey, she was deported and she was deported to England. But we know that the story ends in uh, happily for her in which she finds the the um support that she needs she finds the the way in which she can foster her communist beliefs and become um an integral part of society in england so that when she dies on christmas day in 1964 it is seen as this uh, um, amazing part of english history but unfortunately as i've said it's not seen as a part of American, African-American history, and it should be. People should know who Claudia Jones was in this country and who she became, that she was so important to world history that she was buried on the left side of Karl Marx in Highgate Cemetery in London. So I am at 227. I have many more women to talk about, but I will probably try to incorporate them into any of the questions that you may have for me. So um, at this point, I will open up for questions with the idea that um, when we have someone such as um, Kamala Harris, who rises to be vice president of the United States, um, she is the first person of color african-american as well as asian-american female to be in that position all those boxes that she checks that kamala harris is is because so many women came before her like shirley chisholm who was a school teacher originally from barbados who rises up within the political system in brooklyn new york that has the largest black population in the united states and yet has no representation in six in 1969 in the u.s congress because of the way the voting districts have been gerrymandered so that no black person could ever get enough votes to have a voice in our federal um, government and so um there is a case that's brought one brought by my mentor and her name was or is um, Jocelyn Clopton Cooper, and she was a mentor of mine. And the case is Cooper versus Power, Power being the registrar of, of voters um, in Brooklyn at the time. The case is one in which it was determined after many years that there was racial animus in the districting of Brooklyn. And so 
after redistricting, Black people gain a threshold, political threshold, and Shirley Chisholm becomes the first Black woman to be um, a U.S. representative in Congress and the first Black person to represent Brooklyn. And so I've gone from Queen and Zynga to Shirley Chisholm. There are many people in between, hundreds of other women. And I didn't talk about lynching, which is also something that had taken place that involves Black women. Yes, Black women were lynched in this country as well as Black men. The numbers aren't as high, but it did take place. And the, and the names go on and on. When we think about the, the Black women who have been lynched, we have to consider that whenever there was one step forward for Black people, there was this lynching that would take place in order to teach Black people a lesson that they should not rise up, that they should not have economic um, equity or uh, legal equality, that the, the punishment for such a thing would be death. And so not only did they kill black men in heinous ways, hanging um, with thousands of people that you saw on January 6th, that was a lynch mob. In your lifetime, you've seen a lynch mob. They had a gallows on the Capitol Square in Washington, D.C., in the United States of America in the 21st century a gallows. That was a lynch mob. Those were the types of mobs that would descend upon a Black person's home, drag them out and, and hang them from a tree, burn them alive, cut off pieces of the bodies and use them for souvenirs, take pictures proudly under the hanging bodies or standing next to the burning flesh. This is what has happened in, in America. But I want us to know not just what we've overcome, but the fact that we are overcomers, the fact that we did stand up no matter what. And that's what gives us the ability to not just have this program today, but we have um, so many similarities in our history around the world. And I'm glad I was able to share just a few of the names of the Black women in my book, She Took Justice. Thank you, Tony. All right, cool. So first of all, before we take questions, and if you've got a question, just type into the chat function. If you've got a question, just type it into the chat function. Um, in the meantime, where could we get your book and how much does it cost, please? Well, it's on Amazon and it's also on the UK Amazon because Routledge, which is an English company, is actually the publisher. So Taylor and Francis or Routledge, the publisher of She Took Justice, has it available in um, London at some of the bookshops there, but also it is available online on Amazon and the other Barnes and Noble, the other um, online uh, bookstores as well. And it is only $19. And what's so fascinating about this is I can give you a code and you can get 20% off. Wow. So yes, so 20% off. If you go to the Routledge website, the Routledge website, routledge.com website, then one can receive 20% off the book. Uh, and how long did it take you to write the book? It took me 10 years. Damn. <laughs> Sorry. It took me 10 years. And I'll tell you, I wrote two other books and two other plays in the time it took me to write this book. And it was because I would write the book and I would try to get it published. And, and the publishers would say, no one's interested in, in these Black women. Mm -hmm. And I was I received that rebuff, not just from white people, not just from white women, but also from a couple of black women. It's like, you know, this is this is not interesting. This is not, and I would I would think to myself, these women are the reason why you're in this job now. And you need to understand the, the lineage, the history here. And so it wasn't until you saw all this activity in the last two years as black women made their presence known politically. And then all of a sudden there was like this rush of, oh, we want to know more about black women. So where's that book again that you, you had? So after all this time, I researching my race law in American society book, seeing the black women when I was researching that book and then making sure I took those, those cases and looked at the women behind the cases so that I can bring more to the forefront than, than just the case itself. And all of my books are very accessible. The reason why I like to write through the prism of law is because they write this stuff down in the 1600s to 1800s that you can read what they're thinking at the time because they wrote it as though we would never learn to read. And so when I read these things, I'm thinking, wow, you're just so honest 
These lawmakers are so honest in their duplicity, in their racism. And so it gives you such insight as to what was going on in society at the time. So I was writing these other books and all the, the entire time I'm researching these black women, whenever I would find a name, I would look for that and try to figure out what is the personalized angle. What's the best way to tell this woman's story? And so I have so many other women I really want to add. And I and I feel terrible that I do, don't have all of the women in the book, but I wanted it to be um, a length of a book that it would be accessible to people. They wouldn't look at it and say, oh, that's too long for me to read. And I didn't want it to be an encyclopedia of cases. I really wanted it to be personal so that you got a feel for these women themselves. Oh. Um, Brenda says, you're an awesome author, sis. I have to leave. We'll call you. Thank you for the history lesson. That's from somebody called Brenda. Janita says, from one BIPOC woman, Laura, to another, thank you for researching and writing this book. And hang on a second. And for today's vibrant presentation, lineage is so important for us to know we're a part of. Cool. Those are two comments. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if you've got another comment or question, just tap to the chat. I, I'll go ask you a question, um, Professor um, Brown Marshall. Just, I'm thinking, you are you are presently, or you are a civil rights attorney. You've done a lot of work in the in the environment in that field. So, how did it make you feel when you're reading records from 300 years ago, which literally said that we're not going to punish a white person if you kill a black person, and then you have to go to work the next day and deal with an officer who shot a black guy and just got off of it? Um. It made me feel so terrible and so angry and so sad that I had to use the artistic part of me and I wrote a play and the play is titled Shot, Caught a Soul. And what I want you to do, Tony, if you would, if you don't mind putting the link to Shot on your website, it's 29 minutes and Shot is about a black teenager killed by a white police officer and the black teenager haunts the white police officer demanding to know why he was killed. And that artistic part of me had to be what I could address um, in art that I could not address in law and reality. Because the reality of these murders taking place is so connected to 1669 that I always like to add this so people can know just how long this is going on and the rationalization for it. So when they say, for example, with, with January 6th and that attack on the Capitol, they didn't shoot those people. One person was shot and that was only because that person came within five feet of the vice president and wouldn't stop. Wow. So when you think about all of those men and women inside the Capitol with guns, yet they held fire when they're being beaten with sticks, they're being stabbed with knives, they have tear gas thrown on them, they're being punched by the crowd, and yet they did not shoot. But if a black man or woman is standing there with their arms up, they get shot. They fear for their lives. The officers say they fear for their lives. So yes, the double standard, triple standard hypocrisy, the sin, the wickedness of it all was something I could only truly express through this play that I wrote. And as you said, I, I look at this, I walk around, I go to the store, and all the time you have to think in your mind, what might happen? One false move, who's gonna die today? Over a thousand um, people are killed by police in America every year. Over a thousand killed by police by America every year. Majority of them are people of color, African-Americans. And yet police don't go to trial for this. And I cover as a legal correspondent, I cover some of these legal issues. And I know what happens in England as well is happening in France and Canada and Brazil in, in Nigeria. Police officers are killing civilians with impunity. And so they've been doing this since the 1600s. And it's almost like a nasty, wicked habit that the, the society is allowed to continue and it must change. And that's why I'm also an advocate for national criminal justice reform. And I talk about that um, often um, to, <laughs> to the point where people are like, um, you're, this, they find it offensive to say that we should change a system where our police officers are, are rooted in slave catchers and Jim Crow segregation. That's where our police officers in America came from. The Bobbies of England 
Um, and uh, those bobbies and that the Brit the um the British influence in Boston and New York, that was the bobbies Robert um bringing that in. However, even then the bobbies had their start in slave catching in the British islands. So the whole culture of policing is race based. It's the idea of the bounty hunter trying to find the fugitive slave to the night riders during the time period of Jim Crow. This whole idea that we should be under surveillance at all times, that they should always know what we're doing and have some control over our lives and using law enforcement to do that. So I, what I gained from researching the 1600s and in other time frames that are that are earlier than this one is realizing the vestiges are the remnants we're living with today and trying to get people to see they're playing out a role they inherited. I don't think people even realize that all of these roles have been inherited from generations in the past and that they're playing a role in oppression that they may not realize they're playing some of them, some of them might want it, but others don't realize they're actually playing a role that's, that's centuries long in the oppression of people of color. All right, got a couple of questions here um, from Susan. She says, are educators, especially those at black colleges, interested in teaching she took justice in history classes? I am hoping, I because one thing that happens in she took justice is that I tell it like it is. Because, you know, just like the breeding of black women, this happened, that they would actually have conventions, write books, about how to best breed a black woman to get as many children out of her without breaking her body and making her worthless to them. And then once slavery ends, and I was just on a, a panel not too long ago, the issue becomes, what do we do with this excess labor? We no longer can exploit them, except during the convict lease system where you're using prisoners as your personal servants and making money off of them by leasing them out to businesses and, and jurisdictions. So when you start thinking about what I'm teaching, I think it's something that we all should know. Um, and that includes everyone, people of color, men and women. And I'm hoping that there'll be people who want to teach it. I will tell you this, my other book, Race, Law and American Society is actually being used as a teaching tool in many classrooms now. And I think what people find that's more accessible to it is the fact that these are law cases. I did not create these cases. I'm telling people what, the, what is in the case and they can read the case themselves and read it for themselves. So I think many times they think we're making this stuff up. I think they really believe it's so fantastic to think that one group of people would tell another group of people, you are to work for me for life. And if you run away, your being a fugitive is a crime. You know, your freedom is a crime. Slavery is the law. And then after all that happens, tell us we're too lazy because we don't want to work for half or a third of what you're paying other people. And so every time you think about the absurdity of racism, you think that it's a mental illness. And that's what some people have called it, a mental illness, that you would really think that you're superior to another person because of the pigment of your skin. It's, it's really an insanity that once you peel away some of it, you can see through these law cases how they wanted to maintain superiority through any means necessary. And then it's basically through law and violence. That's the theme that comes out. It's through law and violence that oppression takes place and that people maintain artificial superiority. I got a question from Andrew and he says, Great presentation. Do you find common themes among many of the women you examined across the generations? Yes. And one of the themes I find that I see today in, in Black women and other women of color, but in, in particular Black women, is that we are such iconic Nzingas. We are women, and these women throughout time have decided it doesn't matter what the law says. It doesn't matter that there's violence that could be the consequence for my action. It doesn't matter if no one else agrees with me. I believe somewhere inside of myself that I am worthy of more than this. And I see that in Phyllis Wheatley, um, who has this English connection as well, of course, that we know that Phyllis Wheatley could only get her poetry published in England because they refused to acknowledge that an enslaved 
black girl could have written poetry in the 1700s. And so what happens is this denial of her brilliance so that her poems are not seen as possible, but she knows that her poetry is possible and continues to write it. No one is saying, yes, do that. She has it inside of her to do it. And that's what I see with all of these women, even Celia. Think about this, this teenager who's being raped, who's only known enslavement, says no to Robert Newsom. And the law says, oh, no person who was enslaved can say no to a white person. She did. There was nobody who told her she had the right to say no. She found it inside of herself. So these women, Claudia Jones, who said, I am going to use the mechanisms I can find that will help me and my people. She's looking around, searching for something more. She's not just going to take what's been given to her. So I am very um, proud and very excited by the fact that these women have given so much, but they've also given us so much through the DNA, through these lessons, through these stories. And, and when I'm feeling like maybe I can't do something, I think about what would Harriet Tubman do? What would Sojourner Truth, what would Claudia Jones do under these circumstances? Would Claudia Jones in ill health, with all of these medical conditions, continue to go out and continue to go to meetings, continue to edit this paper, continue to work despite the fact that the U.S. government was, was following her everywhere she went. She continued to do what she needed to do because inside she didn't have to have somebody tell her she was worthy. Something inside said that she was. So I think these women across the board from Queen and Zynga through um, Shirley Chisholm and beyond and even Kamala Harris, you know, they, they said she was too arrogant. They said Kamala Harris, when she was running for president, they, were, they said, you're too arrogant. Now, all these other people are running for president, but they're telling her that she's arrogant for running for president. And, and so when you think about it, it's like, you know, inside, there was something that said, I can be president too. So I like the fact that the similarities, the commonalities that bind all of these women and so many of us known and unknown to the world is that we are going to make our path even if there isn't one for us to walk on. I got a question from Janita and she says, um, do you or any publishers you know of have plans to follow up with more publications on similar themes or which will include all the women and people you think we should know of? How can we best support you in these efforts? Oh, thank you. Well, I'm on Twitter, G Brown Marshall. Brown with an E, Marshall with two L's, G Brown Marshall. So I'm on Twitter, so you can follow me there. And yes, the second part of this is going to be um, from, from, uh, from Shirley Chisholm in 1969. So I'm gonna start with 1970 to the present. And I'm gonna talk about the cases that have happened during that time period, during the Black Power Movement, up until the movement in which we have right now, um, which has been you know, carved out by Breonna Taylor and so many others. I mean, think about the, the lack of prosecution for these cases, the same lack of prosecution we had with over 5,000 people lynched in the United States of America. Those are the recorded ones, not the ones that are not recorded. Over 5,000 people dragged from their homes, dragged from their cars, uh, murdered, hanged, burned alive, 5,000, no prosecutions. So we need to have national criminal justice reform because the failure to prosecute then is just like the failure to prosecute now with people like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. The only reason why George Floyd is actually getting a trial for the police officers is because the world, those of you in England and around the world paid attention. And so I want us to stay in touch. And one thing that Tony and, and we've been talking about over what has it been now the last six months or so, yeah. That, yeah, that we've been talking. And that's because, as I said before, the theme for Black History Month is the Black family. And so um, we reached out to Tony and reached out to people in Canada and South Africa and in France to, to better um, um, bridge those gaps between us so that we can have better communication. You don't want something happening there in Brixton that we don't know about in Brooklyn. There should be more communication between us without using those traditional mechanisms for communication. So you can follow me on Twitter and um, also just, just know that we need to foster 
communication across the Atlantic and the Pacific so that we know what's going on in each other's lives and, and can protect each other and find out more about each other. So I want to, of course, stay up to date on using Tony's website, but I want um, people to, to know that they can reach out to me via my Twitter account. Francine asks about Tulsa. She says, do you think that Tulsa is an example of a whole community being lynched? Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yes. Yeah, Tulsa, Oklahoma, definitely. Rosewood, um, so many communities. Um, Elaine, Arkansas. Um, if you get my book, Race, Law, and American Society, you'll see. And, and it's only $19 as well. And it's much more comprehensive when it comes to race and education, civil liberties, the military, property rights, and internationalism. You'll find that um, there's so much that we have in common that's happened when it comes to education and, and criminal justice, also in that book. And Tulsa was one of hundreds, hundreds of race riots that have taken place in this country in which mobs like the one you saw on January 6th go into black communities with the help of the police department and kill black people, burn down their businesses. And many times this takes place out of jealousy because we have something they don't. We've advanced further than they want us to advance or we have more than they have at the time. And the whole idea of white identity is so based on it. Not all white people, but too often. I, and I've talked to white people, even the most liberal ones, and just ask them the question, if I have more than you do, do you feel lesser than me, do you feel yourself to be a lesser human being if a person of color has more than you do? And I think even white liberals have never been asked this question directly, and so they've never really had to think it through. But there's so much of the white identity that's based in just supposed to be higher than, having more than, wealthier than, more education, smarter than a person of color. So that if you do have more, the sense is that you've stolen it is there illegally or by some type of, of machination, you've taken what rightfully belongs to them. And so these riots like the Tulsa riots and others in the red summer, and this is one other thing, and I, I know we've got to go, um, but just remember the red summer of 1919 in the United States marked the highest number of race riots against black communities in the history of the United States the red summer of 1919. When did that take place? It was right in the middle of the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu was 1918 to 1920. The red summer is what it's called is because there were so many murders that they said the streets ran red with blood. That was 1919. And so as we go through and connect the dots with history, the concern is what are we doing during this COVID? Is this going to be another spark for another red summer coming into 2021? So I want people to keep that in mind, especially after what we saw on January 6th and what President, former President Trump is up to now with these militia groups that are rising up. I want us to be aware of this and to understand that there is a hundred year difference, but they're very few differences between what we're dealing with now and what we were dealing with back in 1919. All right, so the book you mentioned um, a couple of times is Race, Law, and Justice. Is that Race, right? Law, and American Society, 1607 to present. So I do the same thing. I do the arc from 1607 when the um, Jamestown settlement was founded by the English in Virginia. So it's Race, Law, and American Society, 1607 to the present. And would you be prepared to come back and talk about that book in the future? I would love to, Anthony. Thank you very much. Okay. And I thank your audience members for bringing that up. And, and thank you so much for being engaged. And I truly appreciate you. Cool. No problem. Well, thank you for giving us a fantastic talk. And, um, oh, someone says, Gina says, it would be wonderful if you could please share promo, promo code. Oh, the promo code. What's the promo code? Someone wants to get the book. <laughs> okay. FLR20. I believe. F as in Frank, L as in Larry, R as in Routledge, 20. I believe that is from, the from Routledge, from the website, right? Yes, Routledge. Marvelous. Well, again, thank you to you and thank you to your audience. And hopefully, well, not hopefully, we're going to see you again in a couple of months and have another discussion about another book.
That sounds that's fantastic. Thank you. And everyone, please be safe and be well. All right. Ciao for now. See you next time. Okay. Thank you. Bye.